to thank all the legislators, staff, and the interested attendees who took time from their schedule to be with us here today to what I believe will be a very enlightening and informing discussion. In 2012, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that, med that the Medicaid expansion provisions of the Affordable Care Act were unconstitutional because they coerced the states. States could participate in the expanded program, the court said, but only after they made a choice to do so. The federal government could not dictate expansion. Seven years after the court's decision, 37 states had adopted Medicaid in the expanded form. Legislators in the remaining states, and North Carolina being one of them, continue to watch these developments and to ask some key questions. Does Medicaid expansion work? Is expansion the most effective way of bringing health care to the neediest among us? Do the costs and impacts associated with expansion favor a different path? These are the questions that will frame our discussion today. And anyone who has studied Medicaid expansion knows that this is an intensely personal issue that deeply impacts individuals and families. To illustrate some of the challenges, our office developed a video of one family in North Carolina, and we'd like to show that to you now. My oldest son is 19. He has uh, severe special needs. We put him on the uh, waiver wait list at three in order for him to eventually get access to Medicaid. And we waited for about six years before he was able to get that. The Medicaid waiver has allowed us to have helpers with you know, feeding and bathing and dressing because he needs 24-7 care. Some of the challenges with Medicaid, we've had tremendous waits in order to get in to see a specialist. There have been times where current physicians that we have decide not to carry Medicaid any longer. I do have a lot of friends that are in the special needs world, and the struggle is pretty universal. Since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, 37 states have expanded Medicaid. Governor Roy Cooper has not made it a secret that Medicaid expansion is at the top of his policy priority list, but they want our state to expand Medicaid to a population of able-bodied, working-age adults they would be competing with the traditional Medicaid population to find doctors. The traditional Medicaid population is already having a hard time doing that. As we've seen in Colleen's case, individuals with special needs are waiting up to 10 years for services. Access problems for the traditional Medicaid population are only going to increase under expansion. I think a lot of my colleagues in the General Assembly go after this federal money, but there is no guarantee at all that the federal government will continue funding for this expansion population. We spend more on Medicaid in the budget than we do any other priority, and to take that area and grow it by 600,000 people in coverage puts us at risk in our future. Almost every state that has expanded has exceeded enrollment projections and exceeded the budget costs sometimes up to three and four times what they originally predicted. We've really had a great run in the physical responsibility of the state over the past few years. If you start expanding Medicaid in the budget, those costs will erode and eat everything in our budget. They will eventually require higher taxes. Medicaid expansion means you're now gonna add more burden to that system. I would love to see the legislature take the position that they're really putting people first rather than policy or political expediency. Opening up funding for these kids who are waiting uh, would be tremendous.
as our panelists come up. Um, I'm, I'm just asking questions today. Uh, but again, my name is Donald Bryson. I'm the president of the Civitas Institute. Um, today we're hoping to have a robust discussion uh, on North Carolina's Medicaid program, the policy implications of uh, expanding Medicaid, and what are some patient-focused market alternatives to expanding Medicaid. First, just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're defining our terms, uh, what is Medicaid? Uh, to put it as plainly as we possibly can, did you really come in for all of Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi. Sorry, so a friend of mine <laughs> didn't know she was here today. Uh, first, what is Medicaid? Medicaid is a government program administered by the state of North Carolina, which provides health coverage to eligible low-income adults, children, pregnant women, seniors, and people with disabilities. The state of North Carolina and the federal government jointly fund the program. Of the $14.8 billion in expenditures uh, for North Carolina's Medicaid uh, program in uh, state fiscal year 2018, $3.7 billion came from the state coffers, and the remaining $11.1 billion came from federal funding. For the same year, the program provided coverage to 2.2 million North Carolinians. That's roughly 21.2% of the state's population. As I said before, today's panel is here to discuss the implications and potential impacts of expanding Medicaid uh, in North Carolina and what some of the policy alternatives might be. Uh, going from, uh, I guess, your right to my, uh, to your left, or my left to my right, uh, we have Michael Cannon. Uh, Mr. Cannon is the Cato Institute's Director of Health Policy Studies. Cannon has been described as an influential health care walk by the Washington Post and Obamacare's single most relentless antagonist by the New Republic. Previously, he served as a domestic policy analyst for the U.S. Senate Republican Policy Committee, where he advised the Senate leadership on health, education, labor, welfare, and the Second Amendment. He holds a BA in American government from the University of Virginia, congratulations on your national championship, and an MA in economics and a JM in law and economics from George Mason University. He is a member of the Board of Advisors of Harvard Health Policy Review. In the middle, we have Nicholas Horton. He is the research director for the Foundation for Government Accountability. Nick's portfolio of research is uh, focused on Medicaid expansion and welfare reform, including two groundbreaking reports that analyze the impact of work requirements on welfare enrollees, finding massive increases in incomes. He's also the co-author of uh, two first-of-their-kind studies on Medicaid expansion enrollment. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Public Administration and a Master of Business Administration from Harding University. And finally, we have Senator Ralph Hayes, also in the video, by the way. Uh, Senator Ralph Hayes is, uh, serves as the Deputy President Pro Tem of the North Carolina Senate. He is a native of Mitchell County, North Carolina, and he received a bachelor's degree in statistics from Appalachian State before going on to complete a master's degree in higher education administration from NC State. Are you a PAC fan or are you a Well, I mean, you just wear black and white, you're fine, right? Senator Hayes also serves as chair of the Senate Finance, uh, the Senate Finance Committee, as well as co-chair of the Joint Legislative Oversight Committee on Medicaid and NC Health Choice. Uh, before I go into the questions that I have, I know that we wanted to give some opening statements to our panelists. Uh, by the luck of who I pick first, who we've been drawing straws, uh, we're going to go first. I'm going to go uh, from the farthest on down. So, uh, Mr. Cannon, if you don't mind going first with sort of an opening statement on where you see Medicaid and Medicaid expansion. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Did I get it right? Did I get it right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, there's a lot to be said about Medicaid expansion, but just a few highlights. Um, Supporters of the Medicaid expansion will tell you that this is a, a, a popular provision. You know, they will portray, portray it as though it has all upside and no downsides. Uh, as though there are no victims uh, and only beneficiaries of this proposal. But the reality is the exact opposite. This, uh, um, the Medicaid expansion is wildly unpopular. Expanding Medicaid up to 138% of the federal poverty level is wildly unpopular in the state of North Carolina and in every state. Because no state wants to pay for it. We know something is popular, uh, it, the people view the benefits as outweighing the costs. Well, it doesn't really tell us very much uh, about the popularity of a proposal if you push the costs off onto someone else. What tells us whether the Medicaid expansion is popular or not is whether the people of North Carolina would be willing to pay for it out of their own pockets to expand the Medicaid program in this way. And the fact that no one in North Carolina proposed to expand Medicaid to under 38% on the federal poverty level state owned funds tells us that this is not a popular uh, proposal or way to go about uh, expanding, expanding access to health care. Uh, also, this proposal has real victims. They include uh, current and future taxpayers who are going to be paying for this expansion, uh, including uh, current North Carolina taxpayers. 
about 191,000 people currently enrolled in Medicaid's, uh, in, in uh, the ACA's health insurance exchange in North Carolina. The moment you pass a Medicaid expansion in North Carolina, those 191,000 North Carolinians are going to be kicked out of their health plans and left with no choice but the Medicaid program. That's one third of the enrollees in the uh, in North Carolina Health Insurance Exchange, and uh, the list of victims also includes the two thirds who remain in the exchange because their choice of health plans at hope will likely be narrowed, and their premiums will likely be higher as a result of the exchange losing one third of its enrollees. Uh, the victims also include all uh, everyone who uh, pays for health uh, health insurance and uh, health care through the private sector. Medicaid has the effect of increasing prices for private payers. So the larger Medicaid's market share, the higher private prices are going to go. And uh, the list of victims also includes uh, the most vulnerable Medicaid enrollees, the aged, blind, disabled, uh, poor mothers and children. The Medicaid program was originally created to serve because their uh, access to care is going to be on the chopping block uh, when times get tight. Not the able-bodied adults who, who would get uh, coverage under this expansion. The Medicaid expansion would set up a situation where uh, the where state legislators would have incentive to cut education or police that is ten times greater than their incentive to cut health care for able-bodied adults under the expansion. Basically, the Medicaid expansion uh, responds to affordability problems in healthcare just by throwing more insurance at it. You would think that uh, that might help. In fact, it's going to make those affordability problems worse. Insurance increases healthcare prices. It doesn't reduce them. Uh, and so affordability problems uh, for consumers or taxpayers are going to get worse. And every minute that we spend discussing Medicaid expansion is a minute we're not discussing real reforms that would expand access, bring healthcare within the reach of people who can't afford it today, and not cost North Carolina taxpayers a dime. These should include reforms like expanding access to what we call short-term Plans. These are these are, I prefer to call them affordable choice plans that allow you to avoid the hidden taxes and unwanted regulatory costs to ACA plans. Uh, if you uh, allow state residents of this state to purchase uh, insurance plans licensed by U.S. territories, which are exempt from, from the ACA's most burdensome uh, hidden taxes and mandates, you get much of the same effect and even more greater choice for state residents. Uh, you, uh, you should re you could repeal uh, North Carolina's uh, Soviet-style certificate of need law which is blocking competition, reducing access to care, and uh, increasing prices in uh, healthcare provider markets. So too are the scope of practice restric restrictions in North Carolina. You could reform those and increase access to care while not, without sacrificing quality. The American Association of Nurse Practitioners ranks North Carolina among, among the bottom quarter of states in terms of uh, the restrictions it places on uh, scope of practice for nurse practitioners. Uh, and additional reforms include expanding uh, direct primary care, uh, licensing dental therapists, and expanding access to telemedicine. I can go on and on. There are lots of things you can do to expand care to the very population the Medicaid uh, expansion purports to help, uh, but without costing taxpayers a pay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Now we'll go with uh, Nick Horton from uh, the Foundation for Government Accountability. You need your laptop. Uh, I think folks got clicker for me, so uh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much uh, for letting me come in. It's been a couple of years since I've been to Raleigh. Um, we work in about 35 states in Washington, D.C. on this issue and various uh, other welfare reforms. Um, but today, just to kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about, I want to give you just a couple of uh, snapshots of your Medicaid program and what it looks like today, right now, in North Carolina. So I want to give you three numbers really quickly. Michael gave you a lot of numbers already. So I'm going to give you just three. Uh, the first one is 28. 28% of your budget today in North Carolina goes to Medicaid. That's nearly a third. That is one out of every $3 almost that in your Medicaid or in your state budget that has to go to Medicaid. Um, it is consuming your budget. It is growing. Um, and this is without Medicaid expansion. That's what your budget looks like today. The second number is 14. 14 billion dollars that you spend in your state right now on Medicaid. And to give you uh, some context and perspective on what that looked like just a few years ago, in 2000 it was 5 billion. So in less than two decades, it's nearly triple. And again, this is without Medicaid expansion. This is what's happening to your Medicaid program and your state budget today. And then finally, the last number, one. 
One uh, represents a dollar, because every dollar that you spend, if you go down this path and you expand Medicaid for, as has already been said, working age, able-bodied adults, every single dollar that you spend on those adults is a dollar that can't be spent on folks that truly need help. And I have a picture here of a family that I uh, was privileged to meet from my home state of Arkansas a couple years ago. Uh, this is Lindsay and Skylar over here. Skylar spent 11 years on our state's waiting list. She was 12 years old before she got services that she desperately needed. And while she was waiting for more than a decade, most of her life, we added 331,000 non-disabled adults to Medicaid through Obamacare and Medicaid expansion. So 28%, 14 billion, and one, because every dollar you spend on an able-bodied adult is a dollar that can't go to folks like Skyler right here in North Carolina. All right, and Senator Ralph Hawks. Thank you. Um, is that on? Okay. Um, you know, I've been serving now in the General Assembly for nine years. Um, and I think when every legislature comes in with the General Assembly, they come with a list of goals that they want to accomplish. Uh, and when you talk to those legislators, you'll find out that the vast majority of those are in education or in transportation when they come here. And that's where they want to make the investments and that's where they want to go. But when the budget process begins for the first time, everyone gets to learn what an entitlement program means. Whatever priority you have in the budget, there is one area of the budget you do not get to control, and that is Medicaid. We go into Medicaid, we have to forecast how much we're going to spend and set aside enough money to cover that program. Any other program in the state, if we set how much we're going to spend on it, that's how much we'd spend. In Medicaid, you just run a deficit. So coming in. And by my second year here, uh, when we had the big turn down in the economy uh, and some forecasting errors by the department, we faced a 750 million dollar deficit in the Medicaid budget. Took every other priority in the budget went away and you had to backfill Medicaid. Now we got there by a couple reasons. When the economy grant enrollment grew, more people became eligible for the program. More people enrolled in the program. But also the government came in with an enhanced match rate, which meant the previous General Assembly didn't have to make the cuts in Medicaid or the adjustments in Medicaid because they temporarily put more federal money in. Those have expired year after year. Matter of fact, we've got one expiring this year in the uh, Children's Health Insurance Plan, a, a higher match rate. Every instance we've seen from the federal government, those match rates go away, and we as the budget writers in the General Assembly are stuck pulling from every other program you want to make investments in and putting it back into Medicaid. For these same services, we're just getting in a situation where the Fed, we're not investing there because we're getting more from it. We're getting there because the federal government backed that. Medicaid is expansive in North Carolina. We have one of the most benef uh, highest benefit plans in the nation uh, for what individuals receive under Medicaid, particularly in long-term care services. We're up to over 2 million people now in North Carolina are on Medicaid. 20% of our population. But if you want to look at things like births in North Carolina, we're up to almost 60% of the births now in North Carolina are paid by Medicaid. More are paid by that than private insurance, more are paid by that than any others. And you talk to any provider out there and they'll tell you Medicaid doesn't cover its cost of operations. Now, while they tend to leave out certain things in that uh, calculation that Medicaid actually pays, uh, at the end of the day, it is the lowest payer on the list. That's what's coming in. When you talk to a doctor's office or a hospital, they have to have a certain mix of patients to come in in order to be profitable at the end of the day. Rural hospitals, if you get above about 75% uh, government pay, Medicare, Medicaid, or no pay, you can't be profitable as a facility. We're having other conversations about where do we move the 750,000 state employees uh, in that equation. But you have to have a profitable mix. Trying to go in now and expand from one in five to one in four people on Medicaid 
let's not look at the history in other states show that more than half of that population come off of private insurance and onto the Medicaid rolls. Now you're making every rural hospital in North Carolina, for the most part, not able to make a profit. This is what you do when you change the payer. The government keeps coming in with its temporary solutions, with its rate, with its match rates it can't sustain, to get you to jump in. The other thing about Medicaid expansion, there's no out. I can tell you right now, everybody says, well, if this happens, we can pull out, or if the feds change your match rate. I can't find one instance where a court would allow that. I can find you a lot where they can make it a class action lawsuit and force the state to pay it all by state dollars. That's kind of the start of it and others, but thank you all for coming out today, and I know we got a lot of questions. Yeah, we do have a lot of questions. Thank you all for your opening statements. Thank you all for coming out. I know a lot of you have busy schedules, and then the non-legislators in the room, thank you for, for coming out. You all have busy schedules. Uh, but we're going to go through uh, several questions, and we might have some time for Q&A at the end. We'll see how long-winded these fellows are. Uh, that was a joke. I was supposed to laugh. But okay. <laughs> ah, there it is. See? All right. Uh, no, the first question is that... <laughs> uh, the first question is to Nick. Um, just so we can define terms, make sure we all understand uh, what's going on. Um, discussions about Medicaid, change to Medicaid, Medicaid expansion have been in the national policy conversation for a long time, uh, particularly over the past 11 years since Oregon expanded Medicaid before Obamacare even passed. Uh, what do we actually mean for the purposes of this conversation when we say Medicaid expansion? Sure, and I think the best way to kind of frame that up is to really talk, and Senator Heiss kind of touched on this, about what Medicaid expansion is not, because you do have a very generous Medicaid program in North Carolina already today. Individuals with disabilities, uh, the frail elderly, low-income kids, parents with dependents under a certain age and under a certain income level, you have a very generous Medicaid program already today. So that's not who we're talking about when we talk about Medicaid expansion. What we're talking about when we talk about Medicaid expansion through Obamacare is an optional new category into Medicaid that would provide Medicaid coverage for working age, able-bodied adults. As long as they keep their income down and don't work too much, they can qualify for Medicaid uh, really in perpetuity because there are no time limits, um, there are no work requirements, um, it is just Medicaid for non-disabled adults. And I think to give that a little bit more context, you look at other welfare programs that we have, whether it's TANF cash assistance or food stamps, um, you know, non-disabled working age adults generally don't qualify, certainly childless adults don't qualify long-term for those other types of programs. Um, there's a work requirement, there's a time limit. Um, they're very narrowly focused uh, overall. And so you're really talking about something drastic when you're talking about adding hundreds of thousands. I'm sure we'll talk more about how bad the enrollment estimates have been. Um, but based on what we've seen in other states, I think you're talking about closer to 900,000, maybe even a million non-disabled adults that would be added if North Carolina were to expand Medicaid. All right, thank you, thank you. Senator Hines, uh, from your perspective as a, as a state senator from rural Western North Carolina, uh, how is our current Medicaid program doing in helping low-income and disabled people have access to health care providers? Again, that's access to health care providers. And what effect would expansion have on North Carolina's uh, Medicaid program? Well, I think in the rural parts of the state, it is a real challenge uh, to get a health care practitioner into the area and to get them to provide services. Uh, when I started as mayor before the General Assembly, we had a Golden Leaf grant. Uh, for a half a million dollars to bring a single doctor uh, to practice in Mitchell County, a new physician. A half a million dollars couldn't get it done. So coming in. When a doctor comes in and they don't have the practice capacity and others to open up within an area to have enough private insurance individuals to get the payer mix, there's no long-term solution for that. Not to mention we have a problem in North Carolina now, more doctors are dying and retiring each year than are graduating all our medical schools. The number of doctors is not going up in North Carolina, but the population is growing. And for rural areas that often have even declining populations, getting them out there is nearly impossible. Uh, so coming in, the best we can hope for is try to get them to do their clinicals out there and hopefully get married while they're doing it and get external pressures on 
Uh, and that is a strategy. <laughs> but again, it, it, it's so difficult. I mean, if you live in rural Western North Carolina, odds are uh, that from 5 p.m. Friday till 9 a.m. Monday, there is no health care in your county outside of an emergency room. Parents of small children, others, there's not 24 hour clinics and uh, those type of things that you can go check by. You either go to the emergency room or you wait till Monday morning. Uh, that's the way healthcare works. We're trying to get more practitioners out and others, but how do you keep a practitioner when they can go and set up a practice uh, in Asheville or other urban areas um, that can double their profit uh, tomorrow? That's the challenges we've got in Western North Carolina. Adding more people to that lowest paid rate of return makes the problem worse. This is coming in. And so if you're a Medicaid recipient right now in, West, in rural areas of Western North Carolina, trying to find a primary care doctor is difficult. Trying to find an OBGYN is right next to it impossible. Uh, this is coming in and it. If you're going to get services, you're going to go to Ashland. Or you're going to go to Hickory. Increasing that population didn't do one thing to increase practitioners in that area. Actually, it changes the patient mix and makes them less likely uh, to participate in the way. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cannon, as Bob mentioned before, 37 states have expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we talk a lot, uh, and particularly at Sympathize, I know, and conservatives tend to go on ad nauseum about what this is going to do to budgets because we're all always concerned about the government overspending and all that. But what, what data do we have on actual patient outcomes? Uh, how, how does this affect the patients? How does this affect the, their health outcomes in those 37 states from the data we have? So the, the data are not great. Uh, the, the, you know, the best data, uh, in terms of the most persuasive evidence that Medicaid improves health, and I think that in many cases it does, comes from DMAs. Uh, you, you, uh, you provide access to care for at-risk uh, births, and you buy a lot of health doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm persuaded by the evidence uh, uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to that category of Medicaid recipients, but when it comes to the able-bodied adults, uh, adults that we're talking about in the Medicaid expansion, well, the best evidence we have is from the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, which was a really unique experiment because they randomly assigned uh, the most, really the most vulnerable types of people covered by the Medicaid expansion. Uh, we're talking about able-bodied adults below 100% of the federal poverty level, whereas the Medicaid expansion goes all the way up to 138. Uh, what they found was that, uh, that giving these folks access to Medicaid did increase uh, healthcare utilization, it reduced financial strain, uh, on these uh, on these households, it's uh, improved self-reported mental health, and, and these are all very important benefits. But when it comes to measured physical health outcomes, blood pressure control, HbA1c control, cholesterol levels, there was no discernible difference between the control group and the Medicaid group, which is really startling, because you would think these are uh, interventions that are low cost that uh, that that treat uh, often deadly diseases and can have an impact on those very measures within the two year uh, time frame. They were, the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment was looking at, at these measures, but they had uh, no statistically discernible uh, impact on, on any of those things. So that that uh, that should throw up a stop sign in front of uh, in front of Medicaid expansion, uh, has it in some states, uh, has not in most states, uh, because we really don't know what we're getting for all the trillions of dollars that we're spending on this program. Make sure that people can have more access and you'll grow employment in those areas. Um, you need, we need to invest more in medical education, uh, whether that's med schools, whether that's nursing programs, whether that's advanced nursing programs. Uh, I don't disagree with that um, because we have a need for those and those will return an investment very quickly uh, as they come forward. So I think, you know, people are looking for these. All these studies right there were done for a purpose. How do I get a headline to support uh, Medicaid expansion? That's the coming in, and that's not what's really been done here, not what's really stated. Uh, um, I'm going to tune in here, even though I'm supposed to be moderating, but th this, like I said, this part troubles me. One, uh, when you talk about economic development, um, the, the first thing that I hope when legislators consider economic development, they are first thinking about sustainability. Is this sustainable economic development? Basic economic, sustainable economic development off Medicaid is sort of a tricky thing, isn't it? Because Medicaid is what? 
for low income people, even under exclusion, we should talk about a low income population. So you are hoping, you are banking on building thousands of jobs, hoping that you continue to have a large low income population in North Carolina. Think about that. That's not, it's not really an optimistic view of the state, is it? Like, yes, there's a lot of poor people, let's give those that money to doctors. No, that, that's not really a good way to think of it. Furthermore, if you look at a Duke study uh, uh, that talked about, uh, it was out of Duke, but it was published in the Carolina Health Review, uh, it said that for every health, job, health sector job that you claim or that you create, for every hundred that you create, uh, you lose 144 jobs in the macro economy. So if you cross apply that math to the 43,000 jobs that um, the Cone Foundation said that we would create if we expand Medicaid, they said that 20,000 of those would be non healthcare jobs, non healthcare sector jobs, 23,000 would be healthcare sector jobs. And you do the math and you take away the 1.44 jobs for every one job you create in the healthcare sector, you're only netting about 12,000 jobs for a Medicaid expansion that is probably going to cost you about $300 million a year over 10 years. That's not a whole lot. Or, or the, that, that statement, that's right. That's not a whole lot. That's not a very good economic development opportunity. Anyway, I'm going to go on. I'm going to move on to the next thing. But that part uh, truly bothers me. I, I think that there, there's a lot of problems, uh, a lot of ethical problems with claiming we're going to create 40,000 jobs because we don't want to afford people in our state. Uh, I'm going to go to, back to my, Mr. King. Uh, Proponents of Medicaid expansion argue that North Carolina taxpayers have paid, in to, uh, paid for expansion in other states. Uh, it's the pot of gold argument. So it only makes sense that North Carolina, you know, bring that money home by expanding Medicaid. What do you think of that argument? And has North Carolina actually paid into a pot of Medicaid money and not taken from it? Uh, they have not taken any Medicaid expansion money, uh, but there's no pot. There's, there's no, uh, I mean, that whole story, uh, except for that one last part, that whole story is just <laughs> nonsense and betrays either complete ignorance about how federal budgeting works or a willingness to deceive people about how, where the money for the Medicaid expansion is coming from, okay? Uh, uh, the, the way the federal government finances Medicaid is like this. If North Carolina expands Medicaid uh, and spends, say, a dollar on Medicaid expansion, then the federal government will match that with $2. Okay? If North Carolina does not expand Medicaid, does not spend that $1, the federal government will not spend its $2. Now, where does the federal government come up with that $2? Does the federal government raise taxes every time a state expands Medicaid? No. Maybe the ACA was budget neutral because their taxes isn't all that fine. That's a debate we could have, but it's in the past right now because what happens right now is every time a state expands Medicaid and starts spending money on the, its Medicaid expansion, the federal government matches it with money that it gets from borrowing. That's where all of the federal contribution to North Carolina's Medicaid expansion would come from, is federal borrowing. They would be taking that money, not from uh, North Carolina, current North Carolina taxpayers or current taxpayers in other states, but from future taxpayers who don't have any say in this whatsoever. Future taxpayers who may not even be born yet, much less, uh, or may not, be, or may not be able to vote, much less or not, uh, may not have been born yet. And, and this is where all that money is going to be coming from. This is why I say that the Medicaid expansion is unpopular. If North Carolina had to pay 100% of the cost of the Medicaid expansion itself, we wouldn't be here today. We would all be doing other things. Uh, because there's no way this, this proposal would have gotten off the ground. But it, and, and North Carolina could have expanded Medicaid, implemented an identical Medicaid expansion prior to the ACA, or it could do so right now uh, under the old Medicaid program, where the federal government matches uh, the, the amount North Carolina pays two to one. Okay. But uh, even that was not popular enough. North Carolina voters don't even want to pay for a third of this program. The only reason we're here is because the federal government said we'll pick up 90% of the cost. So you put a dollar toward this, we'll match it with $9. Um, did I use the, the old F math when I was using my number before? I did. I said $2 instead of 9 Thank you. You should have corrected me. Just realize it now. Uh, the only reason we're having this debate right now is because the federal government is making it look uh, that much closer to free from the uh, state's perspective, saying you pay one dollar for this, we'll match it with nine dollars. Uh, but even that is not popular enough for to get it across the goal line because we're having to use all these gimmicks like like uh, 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 economic growth multipliers and provider taxes to make it look like the cost of the state will be zero. Uh, and even so, we're still having uh, uh, proponents are still having a hard time getting this across the finish line. My, my favorite uh, contribution to this uh, uh, to this uh, financing uh, bit of uh, 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 issues surrounding the Medicaid expansion came from the Progressive Pulse. Is there anyone here from the Progressive Pulse? 
No? Okay, so uh, the progressive pulse uh, calls provider taxes, quote, this is a quote from the common revenue generating strategies used by states. I thought that was a wonderful euphemism. Provide, because, they're, because Joe Biden calls them a scam. Uh, they are a scam, they are a fraud, a legal fraud, but they're kind of fraud that pushes even lower than 90% of the cost of Medicaid expansion onto the federal government, which is to say onto future taxpayers. And even with that, those sorts of frauds built in and promised, uh, and euphemism to, to describe them, uh, it's still having a hard time getting across the, the finish line. That just shows you how wildly unpopular this proposal actually is. And, and to clarify, the progressive pulse is a blog done by uh, NC Policy Watch, which is a, a progressive think tank here uh, in North Carolina. Uh, Nick, when we talk about Medicaid expansion, we hear about the coverage gap. Uh, I think most of us know that probably applies that some people are not covered by insurance. But can you talk us through sort of the history about how there came to be a coverage gap and why it still exists? Sure. Uh, well, I think we already touched on a little bit the fact that 74% of the Medicaid expansion population that potentially would be eligible for this in North Carolina already have access to private coverage. 63% of them have private insurance. This is according to the Census Bureau. And 11% of them are above poverty, so they're already eligible for the Obamacare exchanges. So I think the problem is uh, it, it's not a coverage gap as much as it's a work gap. Because if you work at minimum wage, even close to full time, you're above poverty. And that means you're gonna, either going to get uh, coverage through your employer, you're going to qualify for uh, the Obamacare exchange, like we talked about, short-term plans, like Michael mentioned. There's a whole host of insurance options out there for folks um, that are willing to work. And if you're not, if you're truly not capable of working and you truly have nowhere else to turn, uh, the Medicaid program is, is there for you. So um, there really isn't a coverage gap. I think, you know, we talked about the myths, and I think that really is a myth in a really big way because for folks that are willing to work, that are capable of working, uh, if they do that, they're going to have insurance options. All right. And, and for, to clarify, we didn't really talk about a coverage gap before 2012, right? Or, I mean, I don't, I don't remember hearing about a coverage gap uh, before 2012. I mean, it, there were people that were uninsured. We talked about the uninsured rate, but the coverage gap came about when the Obamacare lawsuits came in and say, suddenly didn't have to expand Medicaid, right? And now it became a debate. About the coverage gap is at least 20 years old. We talk, people talk about a coverage gap coverage gap during the debate over S-chip in 1990. Oh, sure, sure. Okay, that's fair. That's sure. Maybe a new coverage gap. Yeah, right. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the term. I just don't remember hearing that. <laughs> um, Senator Hayes, uh, we know that there are people that don't have health coverage in North Carolina. Obviously, we talked about the coverage gap. Uh, but our discussion seems to indicate that access to care uh, is more urgent and a separate issue from a lack of coverage. Uh, what policies would you like to pass to the General Assembly to increase uh, access to health care for North Carolinians? If you just could wave the magic wand. Uh, I wish. Um, and I, I expect the other two probably won't weigh on this too, but go ahead. There's a couple I have. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, the elimination of certificate of needs. Uh, the fact that the counties I represent, Madison and Yancey, no one can open a dialysis center, a hospital, an emergency room, an ambulatory surgical center in any of those areas because the state government won't let them. Uh, that's the process we have. Uh, getting rid of the CON laws. Allowing nurses to operate in their current scope of practice uh, without supervision. When you can have clinics in these same areas uh, where a nurse practitioner can keep evening and weekend hours and others and not have to have a doctor on site to be under direct supervision and can make those decisions about whether someone needs to go to an emergency room or whether it's something that can be treated here. Uh, allowing those nurses to do that would be uh, incredible. And then secondly, actually increasing scope of practice. Uh, when you start looking at things that optometrists can actually do versus ophthalmologists that's coming in or dealing with specialty practice and making sure that primary care doctors can do more things in their office uh, that they can do safely and are covered under their medical license just like they are everyone else's. Uh, kind of getting back to that, what we used to have with one practitioner who could do a lot more things, trying to get dental hygienists to actually start filling cavities those type of things, actually expending some of those scope of practices. And then on the health insurance side, um, we have probably one of the highest regulated health insurance with mandates placed by the general assembly. Uh, let's say there it was like 49 different mandates we require people to cover for insurance. And I'm not saying any of those are bad things, but let people pick their coverage that they want, which would lower health care costs. 
and not put these forced mandates in on everyone that does. If you don't need pregnancy coverage, uh, maybe because you're male, maybe you shouldn't purchase pregnancy coverage uh, that's been coming in. Uh, and last, allowing people to find associations. Uh, right now we're in this real fix where you know a private individual has to bear all the risk of a private individual in their market. They have no options for self-funding their health care and buying certain coverage. The government determines the rates and others are gone. You know, if you really start saying that, as Bill would passed earlier, if the Chamber of Commerce in the state or the restaurant associations or the realtors or others could start to put together a realtor-based health insurance policy that deals with the risks that realtors have or construction uh, trades could put together a health insurance that deals with the risks that construction workers have and start selling those to their members. <coughs> Open up those options for people uh, that they can purchase them through multiple plans. And finally, add some competition to the market. One of the good things that Medicaid reform has done is now we've placed uh, at least five insurers in this state uh, with the Medicaid reform that are now offering statewide. Question was this. I want to say we have two handouts at each of your seats about uh, Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion by the numbers, and then uh, another one on uh, what we think the implications are here at Civitas Institute on how it would affect the, the low income people here already on Medicaid rolls in North Carolina. But uh, what, what questions do we have uh, over the last you know, 12 or 13 minutes that we have from, from you all? Yes, Senator Black, or Representative Black, what? I have three questions, but I'll take them one at a time so others can get a chance. <laughs> one of the data points that has been argued with regard to Medicaid expansion, and I think there was a reference to it, I may not get the percentage correctly, is that about 78% of the people to whom it would be extend, uh, expanded are the uh, able-bodied working, able-bodied and or working adults. Uh, who are the other 22%? I think that was your number. So, or, so the, are you talking about the number that's on the, the handout? I think the 78%, the, the distinction there is the childless. So about 82% of them nationally on average are childless. They're all able-bodied working age. So they're all non-disabled adults from 19 to 64 years old. So the remaining 22%, let's say, with the 78% would just be parents, uh, caretakers with kids, dependents. Who are not, I thought if they were parents of a child that they could be covered. Is that just the child? It depends, well, it depends on their income. They can, I'm trying to remember the number off the top of my head. I believe uh, parents with dependents are eligible for Medicaid coverage currently up to 65% of the federal poverty level. Uh, so the remaining 21% would be that group from 65% of the poverty level generally to 138% of federal poverty. Level. Children, pregnant women are all over 138% and it times up to 215% of federal poverty. There is no impact of expansion on children, dependents, pregnant women, family planning. All our rates are already higher than the federal 138. Uh, so it's really that ch parents of children, a group that would go up, I think it's from 65 to 138, and then those who aren't currently eligible for coverage, at, except for a, with a disability or other requiring, which would be uh, able-bodied adults, 18 to 55 years old. Which, which should bring you to thinking on Wednesday when a bunch of people, particular profession, are up here striking on Wednesday, uh, and they want to expand Medicaid. How does adding childless adults help the children? public schools right now through that We do follow-ups over at the legislature. All right. Uh, yeah, well, I'm not a chairman, so you go right ahead. Right. Uh, 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 listen, uh, the 22 percent, let's say that our heart is wanting to do something for them. We're saying don't expand Medicaid. 78 percent of this group is, oh, yeah, uh, they're able to work. Does the expansion of Medicaid to the folks who would be in that other 22% make any more sense uh, as compared to the 78%? Well, if I can take that, the biggest challenge with the Affordable Care Act and ACA um, is there are not options. You can't pick the parts of it that would be best for your state and expand parents and children up to that and pick that population up. You either have to take 
the full qualification to 138% or nothing. Can't do partial expansion. You got to pay for the whole field of Moodle and others. I've, had, I've tried to have a lot of conversations with CMS about what mixed expansions would look like, partial expansions would look like, what different coverages would look like. That's not the offer the federal government's put out there. And let's not forget in this whole conversation, when we talk about the real needs in this study, we have 12,000 IDD individuals in this state right now who can't get access on Medicaid. This is the individuals who are of greatest need. And while Medicaid expansion not only does nothing to address that population, um, it also destroys the resources that we could utilize to expand to that population. Of course, there is a bill to do that. Yeah, there, we have right now tried to look at um, total money. Your program, it's about state dollars. It's about to expand a thousand slots is about forty-one million dollars a year. Uh, so you add in eighty-two million of federal. So add a thousand slots would be about one hundred and twenty million dollars a year cost uh, to get to that, and we're going to have to have that conversation with 12000 But that's what Medicaid's supposed to be. That's what Medicaid is really about, dealing with those people who have serious illnesses and dependencies on the state that we have an obligation to take care of, not how do we have give the latest entitlement program to the able-bodied working adult population. North Carolina and our North Carolinians today, but future taxpayers. So if you want to keep uh, people employed in those counties, uh, I mean, we could really keep a lot of people employed in those counties if we just, you know, double the federal deficit to all, borrow twice as much as the federal government spending and put all that money in, into those counties. Does that seem advisable? I don't think so. Because we pay the taxes. The taxpayers. No, but no, 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 no. We're not talking about. Actually, we're not talking about the money that North Carolina is paying in taxes right now. No, said resources, not taxes. Not to talk about the money that North Carolina is paying in taxes right now, because that money is already spent. And if we're talking about Medicaid expansion, we're talking about I. The, so, so North Carolina to pay money to the IRS. That money's already gone. If what we're going to expand, well, yeah, national defense. I think you know a little too much. Uh, we may disagree on that. Uh, lots of other things. Uh, but at, at, at the margin of the decision we're making right now, the North Carolina is going to make right now, but whether to expand Medicaid or not, none of your money is still in Washington waiting for you to pick it up. None. It's not there. It's a fiction that somebody told you because they wanted to sell you on expanding government by increasing the federal deficit. The only way they're going to come up with, it, with that money it, to, to send to North Carolina, to employ those people in your counties, is to expand the, the, uh, the, the federal deficit even more. That's where the money's going to come from. And most of it, you know, maybe from tax, future taxpayers outside of North Carolina, not inside of North Carolina. If that is an attractive proposition to you, we could, we could, we could talk about that. I, I think it's a moral proposition because you're taxing people without uh, getting their input on this. this is, I mean, I think deficit spending, especially on a level that the federal government doesn't right now, is taxation without representation. So if you want to keep those people employed, and this is your method of doing so, understand that the method of doing so is taxation without representation. There's also the problem of it, you can expand Medicaid all you want, it, it, go above what the ACA does. We don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough hospitals, we have hospital beds, we don't have enough psych hospitals, we don't have enough MRI machines, we don't have enough x-rays. We have the fourth most restrictive certificate of need laws in the country. The only people that are above us are Washington, D.C., Hawaii, and Vermont, uh, which isn't great company if you're talking about health care restrictions. Uh, there aren't going to be doctors that are automatically expand Medicaid. We need to actually have some other reform to actually create the access to care. Uh, and, and 